How much more of the science do you want? I want a good amount of the science. Okay. I'm just a dumb actor. What do I know? Kilometers from here. So um, there's a giant ass glacier, 70 kilometers up that way. Yes. And it's huge, huge icebergs that falls off. So it produces these huge icebergs out here. So this is an iceberg graveyard, kind of. Have you noticed negative impacts from climate change? Yes. The glacier front has retreated around 25 kilometers. Wow. So it's shrinking. Yes. We used to have sea ice, and now we don't have sea ice. So the weather is not as stable as it used to be. There's a lot more wind. We also can see it in the glaciers. They're active all the time. Oh, this is crazy. I'm hearing a glacier collapse out there. That was amazing, that sound. That's the calving of an iceberg tumbling into the ocean. It sounded like an avalanche. Next stop, find that glacier. But first... Just in case you were wondering uh, what the deal was with the sled dogs in Greenland. There are literally hundreds chained up all over the hillsides just howling for dinner time. Sled dog city! Sled dog city! Sled dog city nights! Especially when it comes to the sustainability crisis, where everyone keeps saying that climate change is an existential threat and the most important issue of all. And yet, they just carry on like before. I don't understand that, because if the emissions have to stop, then we must stop the emissions. To me, that is black or white. There are no gray areas when it comes to survival. Either we go on as a civilization or we don't. Take me through the, I don't know, top 10 salient points about climate change. I'll try my best, definitely. But the reason we are in this mess is because we are burning fossil fuels. We're okay. taking uh, stored carbon from deep underground yep. and pumping it up into the atmosphere, yep. wrapping the Earth into a warmer blanket, which means that the average temperature on the Earth is increasing. And when you increase the average temperature on the Earth, of course, you have more extreme weathers, for example, and also acidify the oceans, okay. which is a horrible thing because we know next to nothing of how that will actually change. In about 200 years, we have changed the chemistry of the ocean more than the Earth has or nature has for the past 50 million years or so. Humanity has changed the chemistry. chemistry of the oceans in the last 200 years more than in planet Earth in the last 50 million years? That's right. Each day, we pump up about 100 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. Every single day, yes. three volcanoes going off nonstop it, to equal what humanity is pouring into the atmosphere. That's right. It's almost the way we live. Right. <laughs> so we need to change everything. Another one you hear a lot in the States is like, well, China and India produce so much more CO2. Why should we do anything until they get their act together? Well, because historically, we are the biggest co contributors. Half of the emission of CO2 into the atmosphere comes from about 10% richest part of the population of the Earth. A person, for example, in India uh, is responsible for about two tons per person per year. Okay. But in the US, well, it's about 20 tons person. Holy moly. So it's our fault. That we need up. to change our ways. Yeah. Not the poor people. We have to uh, help the I'm poor doing people. all right. I was on a TV show. I don't know if you heard that. <laughs> I heard Pretty about well known. Although Not so I, much in Iceland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I had to Google you. I'm afraid. Oh, you're a horrible man. <laughs> I then asked Saivar what the main causes were behind all these emissions wrecking havoc on the planet. Doing great. I'm, I'm good. Here we go. Construction. Yep. We use a lot of cement. Choices we make when it comes to the food we consume. Red meat. Red meat is a big source of CO2 emissions as well. We keep cutting down trees, which are kind of like natural vacuum cleaners for CO2. So then planting trees might be a helpful solution. Planting trees is definitely a helpful Not solution. Not eating beef. At least less beef. Boom. How do you like that? <laughs> Boom. Our food wasted. We waste an awful lot of the food we buy. About right. a third or so ends up in the trash. Whenever we throw our trash into landfills, uh -huh. it breaks down. Does that create CO2? or that, that does create CO2 and also methane. Methane is a much more powerful uh, greenhouse gas. We call it methane, methane, just so you know. Methane or methane. You could say methane. <laughs> you say methane, we I say, say we methane. Say, we say methane. 
clothes. We use a, an awful lot of clothes. It takes a great deal of energy and water and everything to produce clothes. Isn't it um, just general consumerism of just buying lots and lots of manufactured oh. stuff? Manufacturing is a big contributor as well, especially when it comes to electronics. Because uh -huh. you need to dig up all the metals to use in your electronic devices. Also, the way we transport things around the world using airplanes and ships and cars. Maybe we need to slow down a little bit slow and co con consume a little bit less. Right. We don't need to fill our houses with crap we don't really need. Viking. What percentages of the Earth's uh, animal species will be lost to climate change in, say, the next 20 to 50 years? Well, we know that about 25% of all plant and animal species on the Earth are in danger of becoming extinct. And if we look throughout Earth's history, we can find at least one event for the past 100 million years or so where the same or even worse has occurred. It's and that a was, mass extinction. That's right. It was mm -hmm. about 66 million years ago when an mm -hmm. asteroid impacted us. But these days, we are the asteroid and we have to stop it. We have to do everything we possibly can to do so. Furthermore, does hardly anyone speak about the fact that we are in the midst of the sixth mass extinction, with up to 200 species going extinct every single day. That the extinction rate is today between 1,000 and 10,000 times higher than what is seen as normal. Yes. This is literally where a glacier meets the ocean. Ground zero for climate change. So, uh, David, uh, Dr. David Hick, not hike, is that right? I can take a hike, but David Hick, yes. If you tell any more jokes, I'm throwing you off this boat. It sounds like thunder in the background, like through this interview, but what is it that we're actually hearing? We are talking to a glacier. It's talking to us. It's telling us that its journey from the center of Greenland into the ocean is nearly complete. Can you distill for me, because I'm kind of a climate change dummy, can you kind of break it down for me? What are some, some chief salient points? So the first thing to remember is for Earth, for our whole planet, it's a climate system. So all the parts are connected, which means what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. Okay. We think of the Arctic as being a cold place, but that helps to regulate the climate on the rest of the planet. And as the Arctic warms up, that cold, the balance between cold and warm gets mm -hmm. kind of blurry. So one example of that is the jet stream that goes around the Northern Hemisphere. Okay. And as it warms up in the Arctic, you start to see uh, cold air coming further south and warm air going further north and you get crazy weather systems. We're seeing heat waves that we're not prepared for, extreme weather events, uh, potential for an increase in things like uh, hurricanes or tornadoes. So those one in a hundred year events are going to become one in a decade events that mm -hmm. will then become annual events. Now, what this carbon accumulation contributes to is called the albedo effect. And all that means is that from a, a value of one would be a bright white surface and reflects all of the solar radiation back yep. into space. And a value of zero would be like an asphalt highway. All of that solar so radiation sweet. just yeah. gets soaked mm -hmm. in and it doesn't reflect anything back. So the darker the surface area, the more it warms and the faster it melts. The other thing is you have a shift from an ice covered ecosystem to an open water pelagic ecosystem. That changes the whole food web. So things like polar bears or seals uh, that rely on sea ice, yeah. they're not there anymore. There's also an entire ecosystem of small organisms, microorganisms, algae, zooplankton, that live on the bottom of sea ice. No yeah. ice means no plankton under the ice means certain fish don't get to eat that plankton, may die or go away. And right. then seals that eat those fish right. may die or go away. And then polar bears that eat those seals may die or go away. That's right. So the whole system will shift to something new. So polar bears and seals are um, They need sea ice. And this is where people usually, people usually start talking about hope. Solar panels, wind power, circular economy, and so on but I'm not going to do that. We've had 30 years of pep talking and selling positive ideas. And I'm sorry, but it doesn't work. Because if it would have, the emissions would have gone down by now. They haven't. 
And yes, we do need hope. Of course we do. But the one thing we need more than hope is action. Once we start to act, hope is everywhere. So instead of looking for hope, look for action. Then, and only then, hope will come. What is happening in the Arctic is affecting all of our lives. Droughts that we've had. Which caused the forest fires. Which caused the forest fires. There it is. So I was talking to a friend of mine about this talk, and he said something that caught my attention. He told me an idea this extreme would automatically put him off. I thought to myself, wow, is this an extreme idea? I mean, if anything, I thought people would think of it as being utopian, something too grand, something that will work in theory but has no real practical implications. But it also got me thinking about how we use the term extreme. If the idea of a world without money is extreme, then what kind of words would we use to describe a world with money? Moderate, safe, are these the words you think about when you think of your relationship with money? Or do you automatically start thinking about how much more of it you need to meet your next goal? Maybe it's to buy a house or start a family. Maybe it's more immediate things like paying this month's rent or getting enough food. Now that you're thinking about money, are you feeling a bit stressed out, anxious? Well, you're not alone. Money issues have consistently ranked as the number one cause of stress and anxiety in the US and the UK. Of retirement? So no matter how you look at it, money is an extreme idea. On an individual level, it forces us into decisions we might not otherwise make. As a society, it forces us to compete against each other. And it even paralyzes our government from being able to meet our needs. But what's the alternative here? So if you want to think about a world without money, it's not to go back to some kind of mythical barter phase of the economy that never really existed. We need to move beyond the idea of exchange altogether. A world of equal access. A world where everything from housing, food, education, and even the things we consider as leisure require nothing in exchange a world where all of these things are absolutely free. Because in real life examples of a world without money are as diverse as the ideas we have of our current world with money, yet they're continuously thrown aside, even though we know we're gonna have to relook at our relationship with money as automation takes over our lives or our work. But even if automation wasn't happening and there isn't this impeding force, wouldn't an idea of a world without money be worth pursuing just to counteract the extremes that a world with money has created? A world that has convinced us we need something external to us to control and motivate us? Don't we deserve to see ourselves as something more than that, as individuals to be empowered by our natural resources, to give into society based on our natural abilities and take from it out of our needs? I think it's about time we look at these, these ideas with a bit more consideration. Our future just might depend on it. Thank you. People, yeah, people always ask me the question, why do you live without money? And, and today there's an infinite number of reasons why I live without money. It's not just one anymore. But I'll, I'll kind of outline three today. The first one was uh, an initial realization that a lot of the social and ecological issues we're faced with today, such as ecological destruction, the masking of the oceans, sweatshops, factory farms, deforestation, all these things that we pay lip service to actually caring about. Um, th th these things stem from our delusion that we're, we are separate from nature. We're not separate from nature. And it also stems from the fact that we're very, very disconnected from what we consume. So because of the, the widening degrees of separation between the consumer and the consumed, we no longer have any real appreciation for the embodied energy, the embodied destruction, the embodied suffering that goes in to every stage of the supply chain in the things we buy. We never get to see these people. The tool that, that enabled this disconnection um, is money, especially in the global format that we see it today. So I'll, I'll give you some examples. If we all had to grow our own food, 
we wouldn't waste a third of it as we do in the UK right now. If we had to make our own tables and chairs, we wouldn't chuck them out the moment we decided to change the interior of the core. If we had to, if we had to take responsibility for our own drinking water, I doubt most of us would pee and poo in it. Um, it wouldn't make much sense to pee and poo in your own drinking, in, in your own drinking water. Um, and so until we, until we reconnect with what we consume, and what I'm talking about is a component. It's how I live without money is quite a big question. And um, people ask me that every day, how, how do you live without money? Um, and given the, the time restraints, I've just got to touch on a few things. But for example, food. Um, I grow all my own food. Um, I, I forage some food from the wild. As you can imagine, um, this list goes on and on and on into every kind of crevice of my life. To answer the question of how I wipe my bum, uh, I use uh, either leaves or I use newspaper. I once had the experience of actually, um, I was, I was uh, cutting off a piece of newspaper and um, I was about to give, give a wipe. And I looked down and it's a story about me. And, <laughs> and uh, it was, as you can imagine, my ugly mugs on the, on the paper. And I thought, there's not many chances in life to have such utter disrespect for yourself. <laughs> so you've got to replace what you normally have, what you, what you normally do with money, with a relationship either with the earth or with the people around you. And it's, it's, those, it's those bonds, it's, there's an intimacy when, when, you have, when you're dependent on people, when you're dependent on the earth. That intimacy and that, the bonds that are created from those relationships, have got, when, when they're taken away, there's huge social implications of this and they're, they're grossly misunderstood. Well, um, I think I've, I've come here today, I haven't come here today to convince an entire room of people to live moneyless tomorrow, you know, um, I, you know I'm, a, I'm an idealist at heart, but I'm also a realist, and I know none of you guys are probably going to go and lunch and burn your wallet and all your credit cards and cash, it's, it's probably not going to happen. Having said that, I think if any of you did want to live moneyless, um, you, I, I'm pretty useless at almost everything I do. Um, if I can manage to live money less, trust me, you guys can do a much, much better job than me. But what I've come here to do today is show you that there's, there's many lens through which you can see the world. So the lens that we've had on for the longest time now is, is a lens called, how much can I get? And what I'm trying to say to people is that on the table in front of you, there are a number of lenses. If you take off this lens, how much can I get? And stick on a new lens called, how much can I give? Or think. <laughs> or think you wake up in the morning and you see another lens called, how many people can I make smile today? And I woke up this morning and I, you're going to have to help me with this one. I woke up this morning and said, I'm going to make 1,200 people smile at the one time. <laughs> if, If anybody isn't smiling, you're, 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 you're incredibly poor people. Well, and so, yeah, so what I want to create is a world where there's no other reason, what, what are, as I said earlier, what other reason do we need to give than the fact that somebody needs help? Why do we need to get something in return? It's, a, it's an old mentality, and I'm trying to get people into a new mentality. And so the one thing I'd probably leave you with today would be this. Whether you completely, what you, if what, what you believe is in complete contradiction to what I believe, go and be the change you want to see in the world. You know, whether, whether you agree or disagree with me, whatever you believe in, whatever you're passionate about, go and be the change you want to see in the world. Have, have no discrepancy between here, between here, and between here. What the world needs now is action, not words. You know, uh, everything, I think, until the soldiers of peace become as brave as the soldiers of war, little is going to change. And every single person in this room, from you to you to you, is a soldier of peace. And I, I, would, I would beg you, please, 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 leave here today and go and be the change you want to see in the world. Go and have courage. Go and put exactly what you believe into action. You would not believe how, how easy it is that when you actually put what you believe into action, then it can happen. And that's what's going to change the world. It's not, going to, it's not going to change from us sitting in bars and talking about it. It's going to come from action. Apply 
your beliefs into action and you will change the world. You will change the people around you and you will change the world. So I beg you, please, please, please help us change this world. The world needs changing. And so I'll leave you. I just wish you all the courage and strength you're going to need to go out there and make this world a better place. Thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, so this is kind of like an alternate way of looking at things. People often get really offended when I come up with ideas like this or they get aggressive because they think they don't they think this is the only way we can live, this is the only way it's possible to get food and water and clothes and and be able to live. It's the only way. So I'm just gonna invite you now. I'm out in nature as you can see. Just take a minute and, it's a bit windy, close your eyes and meditate with me for one minute, okay? And then you're gonna clear your mind and imagine money didn't exist when you open your eyes. Just try and clear your mind, focus on your breathing when you have your eyes shut, because it, it keeps you in the moment. If your mind wanders, focus back on your breath. Okay, it's a great technique to use if you're stressed or something. You find a bit of land, okay, in nature, you don't know who owns it, okay, it, no one owns land, okay, earth is for all humans, okay, to be in communities and be happy and live together, okay, not to say you can't be on my land and kick each other off and lock each other up for trying to build a home on someone else's woodland or something, you know, and a lot of the time it's not owned by actual public it's owned by corporations and businesses and councils so you find a bit of land and you know it's easy to acquire skills to learn of one another how to build shelters huts and it's called off-grid living sorry my hands going a bit numb so because I'm holding this camera up it's called off-grid living and basically what you do is you there's a lot of, they're called eco-villages and they're built, you know, you live in um, tents, in wooden huts and you basically barter with each other and you you give, you give grow food, you garden, you, you don't pay tax, you don't pay bills. Okay, what you do is you, you live off the land, okay, so you garden everything yourself. You get plots and crops and you grow everything yourself. On about people like dictatorships and um, monarchs, monarchs and uh, people like that, you know, that have done nothing to earn what where they are right there. And there's people starving to death that don't deserve to starve to death, you know? And then people comment, so what's the solution? You don't realize you're in a you're trapped, you're in a cage until you realize you're in the cage. To get out the cage is to realize you're in a cage, okay? I know a lot of people are thinking, what is he talking about right now? But when you understand how the system works and you research and you find out what truly is going on, that's, that's when you realize, that's the solution is to realize what's going on. Do what's natural, doesn't it? You know, people say, what's the solution? Let's run them down. <laughs> no, 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 all these protests and things, crazy, crazy things going on. Um, do what's natural, just ignore it. And it's really hard, it is hard, but living off the land is is natural and it's, it's about getting community and making it happen, okay? Realizing that you don't need this, okay? It's, it's a way that they trick you, because it's been around 
before you were alive you think oh that's just how it is you know like everyone has a passport before you were born everyone had a passport so you're like oh yeah that's normal so I'll get a passport birth certificate you have to have that because everyone else has that um, and that's how it works you know in school we ask to go to the toilet ask to go to the toilet and we're told if we can or cannot go to the toilet okay just think about that asking to go to the toilet and someone having authority over your own bladder no wonder why adults nowadays question nothing because they're taught not to and if you do you get in trouble detention lunch all this kind of consequences they give you at school okay off-grid living's the way to go eco villages recycling community and also and what we call good weather because in some people's opinion you know they don't like rain and s rain and storms but some people do and some people hate sunshine and other people love it so there's no such thing as good and bad weather it's just you know what you may not like wind it makes your time slower but it doesn't change you as a person and being alive and things um, but that's all I have to say, so peace guys, and uh, what do you think about this? Uh, with the old queen on it, the ruler of us, British subject. What do you think though, I want you to just put down below your opinions and uh, peace. This is Mark Boyle, also known as the moneyless man, as in the past he lived without any money for three years. Nowadays he lives in a self-built cabin in the countryside of Ireland, off the grid, without any modern technologies. Let's have a look how he lives from the land in his cabin and why he chose for this very special lifestyle. Hey guys, uh, welcome to my crib. Um, the jacuzzi is uh, non-existent. Uh, the sauna is out the front. Yeah, this is a cabin I built almost three years ago. Almost entirely out of, out of uh, materials that grow uh, in the surrounding lands. So I would encourage anybody who wants to do something like this to just go and start. You know, ask people, ask your neighbours, ask uh, anyone for advice and take it from there. It's a lot less complicated than you'd think. Um, and the results can be really, really rewarding. What's up, brothers and sisters? Coming at you with another video. I'm out here in the abundance among the trees. And don't forget to get your bare feet on the bare earth. You won't regret it. You know, I, I find that it's very important for me to get out of the city. You know, a lot of people really have attachments to the luxuries and the comforts of the city but for me I, I can't really reside there for very long without getting pretty uncomfortable I have to get outside into the oxygen get the fresh air I mean I'm just looking around and I'm seeing a lot of food I'm seeing a lot of edibles I'm seeing a lot of things that are really very useful for the human organism like all of this, this is called salal. This is an herb. It's highly medicinal. You can dry it and make teas with it, or you can just eat these leaves in the spring and summertime. They have really delicious berries. They almost almost look like blueberries. And am I making tons of money? No, and that's not really my goal. That's not really my objective. I prefer to break dependencies. I prefer to break addictions to things like money 
and to copious amounts of food and drugs and substances to mitigate my stress. I prefer to live without being controlled by these things than actively seeking them out and making that my entire life purpose. I, I really want to break those sorts of ties and that's a big reason for coming out here and living in this sort of a situation where I'm, I just feel like for the first time in my life when I came out here I felt like I had everything that I needed. I, my needs were finally being met. I had nurturing relationships. I had just high quality abundant food from nature. I really make use of all these wild herbs and just the amazing life force energy from the earth and just this amazing high quality air, this oxygen, it, it just makes it so worth it. It makes my world go around. I mean, I can't, can't tell you how to live your life. I can't tell you what to do, obviously. But oxygen doesn't come from carpet and plaster and drywall and paint and stainless steel. It comes from this. So why, why do we surround ourself, ourselves with carpet and plaster and drywall and stainless steel and, and car fumes? And why would we live in the city where we're inhaling tailpipe and fumes from heavy industry day in and day out? It just makes so much sense for me to be out here where I feel that my needs are being met and that my body, this vessel, this organism is actually being supported instead of bombarded with all of these toxins and heavy metals and pollutants and things. So to me, those are just a few of the advantages of living out here in the wild, or at least closer to the wild. I live in a cabin. I don't actually, you know, just roam the earth barefoot. I just feel that I've found so much healing and so much progress and so much flexibility in my life, being able to live, you know, away from a work type situation, like a nine to five job like that. And just being closer to nature where all this medicine exists. Like there's so much of this blackberry plant out here. Them, you can just eat them. And in the store in the city, you have to pay like six ninety nine for a little container of blackberries, like four ounces of blackberries or something. It's ridiculous. And out here, it's just endless blackberries for free, free of charge. You just have to have the motivation to pick them yourself, which is, in my mind, a really valuable experience. You get to interact with a plant and really get to know it. You get well acquainted with these other forms of life. And it, it really brings you outside of yourself it really allows you to expand your awareness by interacting with the plant kingdom so for me it's just a win-win-win situation and i hope that i can just really inspire you to you know be be closer to nature be closer to your earthly mother be closer to source because it's really where the energy exists you know, in the city, I just feel after a while that my energy is being drained out of me. It's being robbed. It's being siphoned away by all the psychological and all the physical pollution. But out here, I just feel really uplifted and nurtured and supported. And I feel that the same is true for a lot of people. I think we're reaching a, a tipping point in Earth's history where we're really discovering that we're really changing our mind about what what is poverty and what is wealth where where do these things actually exist is wealth having a bunch of um, access to comfort things like food and alcohol and quick transportation and starbucks and like sit down restaurants and things or is wealth having just the simplest form of nourishment surrounding you and cradling you. Beth, my wife and I, we sort of had grown over the corporate lifestyle and, and the trap of having and wanting more. So we thought, okay, let's just cut our ties from what we'd known and we'd been working in for many years. And we, we thought, okay, let's just start afresh. So we'd been to New Zealand a number of times previously and we just thought that's a great place to just start and we'll, we'll look at alternatives and live a simpler, more sustainable life and, and just explore what's out there. 
it was then the realization sort of hit home. I started to research more, read, you know, hundreds of articles and watched hundreds of documentaries and all sorts of stuff. Then I started to really understand, wow, we've got some serious issues here and no one's really talking about this stuff and, um, and it's quite scary. So, you know, we're attracting bird life and wildlife through just letting nature be as opposed to wanting to control it. Start growing food. That's where a lot of this, these initiatives start. Food is central to the way we live, our health and our whole ecosystem environment. So if we can start doing something small, like even if you, if you just live in a su suburbia and you've got a small block, you can start growing food. Even if you're in an apartment, you can, you know, windowsills, pots, whatever. You can start, and that's the first step. Once you engage with growing and experiencing nature, then things start to happen. You and it's like a uh, like a flower. It starts, you know, growing, getting bigger, and then then that leads to something else. So, get out there and explore because there are options. We just have to have the capacity to realise that we're not stuck, and we can change and 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 just just do it. I love Andrew's story because it contradicts a belief that underpins our society that earning large amounts of money and having expensive material possessions are what lead to happiness. We've been fed this lie by businesses and governments in order to make profit and to perpetuate the growth economy that's contributing to the destruction of the earth. By each one of us refusing to believe this story our society tells us, together we can create a world where the deep satisfaction we all desire comes from our connection with community and nature rather than from material possessions. In the face of the crises the world is facing today, a new way of being is emerging, where we're connected to nature and exist in harmony with all other forms of life. And it's up to us to pioneer the transition to this deeply satisfying, nourishing and truly sustainable way of life. I definitely feel happier and less stressed. When you're working in the corporate world, it's very competitive. Um, and I tell you, there's, there's not much competition out here, apart from a few weeds, which I get uh, upset with. But now I've, I've learned to let go, and, and, and now I eat some of the weeds. I definitely feel better, and I feel more flexible. Um, I don't have any aches or pains anymore. And I just feel more connected and um, more lively. I eat much healthier now. I don't eat any processed foods. Uh, we had a lot of vegetarian meals and it's all fresh, organic uh, produce. So we, we also live a less consumerist lifestyle, so we don't need as much stuff. So I haven't got this constant craving for more and more things to make me feel satisfied or happy. This lifestyle, working on the land and doing permaculture, it feels more rewarding and like I'm putting something back with a lot of current society, it's take, take, take. And, and with this sort of lifestyle, I feel like this is long term, I'm, I'm putting something back. So there you have it, we have homegrown salad, uh, fruit salad, uh, green salad and some eggs. And I can't believe still that I don't have to go to a supermarket. We've grown all this ourselves in just three years. I'm still amazed. So anyone can do it. For the last year, I have been growing and foraging 100% of my food. No grocery stores, no restaurants, not even a drink at a bar. Nature has been my garden, my pantry, and my pharmacy. I'm here in Orlando, Florida, and this abundant garden that I'm standing in right now, this was just a lawn like that when I started. I don't own any land, so to grow my food, I met people in my neighborhood and I turned their front yards into gardens and shared the bounty of food with them. And while I was here, I built a 100 square foot tiny house along with my friends to serve as my simple homestead and my base. In my gardens, I grew over a hundred different foods. Dozens of different greens packed with nutrients, sweet potatoes, yam, and yucca for my caloric needs, delicious fruits like papayas and bananas, pumpkins, carrots, beans, and beets, so many vegetables, and herbs and peppers to flavor all of my meals. And I also raised bees so that I could have my own candy shop right in my yard.
In addition to the huge bounty from my garden, I foraged over 200 different species from nature. I harvested my salt from the ocean simply by collecting it and boiling it down. I got my caffeine from the native Yapan holly tree. Not only was I my own grocery store, I was also my own pharmacist. I grew fresh turmeric and ginger right in my gardens. I harvested wild elderberries to make elderberry syrup to prevent cold and flu. I harvested reishi mushrooms and different medicinal teas and also grew moringa, also known as the vitamin tree. I cooked up dozens of different healthy meals, fermented veggies to make sauerkraut, and made delicious beverages like honey wine and ginger beer. I whipped up delicious desserts and ate the healthiest of my entire life. And I even grew my own toilet paper. This my name is Kalle. And this is the story of my journey to a more simpler and more meaningful lifestyle. Two thousand and eighteen was the year I left my full-time job and apartment in Stockholm. Both body and soul had had enough. I felt like a stranger and wanted no part in a society where we spend money we don't have to buy things we don't need to impress people we don't even know. So I bought this simple cabin. Where a few weeks after I started calling this place my home, Tuss moved in. I couldn't have asked for a better friend than her. Just like me, she's full of energy and loves to snuggle. There's no in-between. It's either off or on. When spring finally came, it brought not only the warmth, but also a calming feeling in my whole body. The feeling of digging your toes into the grass made it feel just like home. I felt grounded and connected to the nature around me. So ago I told my friend Oscar that I've met someone and that she's moving into the cabin. I explained that I've never thought I would actually find someone that would want to live in the cabin. He just paused for a second and said, Kalle? No one believed that. Well... Even though she's competition, Tuss has accepted Christina into the pack and we are now our own little family. and uh, solve this entire uh, climate change problem. It enables us to contact people who are far away. But is it true that sometimes, even when we are together, it keeps us apart? What do I wonder? Is there any way that we can bring a little bit more humanity into our own lives? And we're so busy chasing after money and amassing personal possessions, what if that wasn't so important to us? On the left here is a photo that Boson took in San Francisco of a couple of very tall buildings. He said, boy, those are so high, I, my eyes are too short to see the top. That's an example of our technology, our very rapidly evolving technology. On the right is another equally impressive technology but one that's invisible to us. This man's house in Bosun's village was actually grown to that shape. It wasn't built out of metal or steel. It wasn't cut into the tree. His ancestors actually grew it in the shape that they wanted. Now that's technology. Today, 
we use 100 million barrels of oil every single day. There are no politics to change that. There are no rules to keep that oil in the ground. So we can't save the world by playing by the rules. Because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change. And it has to start today. Thank you.